Congresso Internacional sobre Drogas, Lei, Saúde e Sociedade. Uma oportunidade inédita para se redefinir os rumos da política sobre drogas no Brasil. Meu nome é Celica Cavalari, eu sou psicóloga e sou vice-presidente da Abrand, que é uma associação multidisciplinar de estudos sobre drogas. Mas... Eu, há muito tempo, acompanho essa política de drogas. E nós fizemos muito esforço para que a lei fosse mudada. Hoje nós temos uma lei que dá, criminaliza um pouco menos os usuários. Ela não tem nenhuma década, ela é de 2006. E estamos correndo o risco de um retrocesso muito grande. Né? A... Então, uh, isso é uma coisa preocupante, porque o avanço veio há pouco tempo. Então, cansa é muito cansativo isso também, por um lado. Por outro lado, me chama muito a atenção. Eu gostei muito da fala ontem do César Gaviria, ex-presidente ex da Colômbia. Mas, assim, essa Comissão Internacional de Ex-Presidentes, Todos os ex-presidentes, depois que saem do poder, mudam de posição. São muito progressistas. Enquanto estão no poder... O <risos> que, que você acha disso? Bem, well, um, with respect to the first point, I agree. It's demoralizing when you take a step forward, like with your law of 2006, and now you see the possibility of it being rolled back, and even hear people blaming the law, although that was not the problem. People get tired. The answer is, take a vacation and come back, because this struggle is going to take many, many years. And as we saw in the United States, in the late 1970s, many people thought that we were close to legalizing marijuana. By the 1980s, boom. In 1979, 51% of first-year college students said legalize marijuana. 10 years later, in 1989, only 16% supported legalizing marijuana. That was demoralizing. But now, 60% say yes. So change can happen. And our job is to push and prod and pull. Quite frankly, the issue of medical marijuana, which you have a little bit here, is an important one. First, because the persecution and prosecution of people who use marijuana as medicine is the worst part of the war on marijuana. But secondly... When we started to talk about medical marijuana and to change the laws, it changed the bigger discussion around marijuana. It meant that older people became the symbol, not just young people with long dreadlocks and hemp leaves in their hair. Believe me, if I could have long blonde dreadlocks and hemp leaves, I would. But, um, so change can happen and one needs to push. And that's true not just with marijuana. Now, our drugs are, our national drugs are, now more and more he talks about drug use as a health issue and reducing incarceration. Now, the actual policies do not follow, match the rhetoric. The rhetoric is better, but the rhetoric is changing and soon the policies will too. Now, secondly, about the ex-presidents, Cardoso, Gaviria, Zidio, Lagos, others who are joining. Yeah, I know. But I'll say two things about that. The first one is, better a president who retires and then speaks up with us than a president who retires and says nothing. I mean, Cardoso and Gaviria and Zidio and Lagos and now the president of Poland and Jimmy Carter, they all have many things to do. 
but especially to see the passion and commitment that Cardoso has devoted hundreds of hours traveling around the world, making a documentary. I mean, I've been with him in many places now and learning the issue, not just the top, but deeply. It's incredible. I mean, Brazil should feel very proud that Cardoso had done this. And I wish Lula would too. And the second thing is, those ex-presidents provided the inspiration for other presidents. So now you have Santos in Colombia saying, open the debate. Otto Perez Molina in Guatemala, open the debate. Mujica, legalize marijuana. And from the left, the right, and the center. I, I, you probably didn't see this. Last year, when President Santos in Colombia had the summit of the Americas, all the presidents in Cartagena last April, and President Correa of Ecuador, the Chavista in Ecuador, did not go because Castro was not invited. A few days later, he gave an interview. And what did he say? Correa said that he thinks the bravest president in Latin America is Otto Perez Molina, the president of Guatemala, the former general and head of military intelligence involved in the dirty wars with a, of the 1980s. And he said, he is the brave. The left-wing Correa saying that about the right-wing Otto Perez Molina, right? Why? And Correa says, I feel a little embarrassed to talk because my father was in prison, I think in American prison, for selling drugs. Now, in two weeks, the Organization of American States will release some report. And hopefully, it will open up some discussion. So the ex-presidents, when they join us, hug them and abrazo. <laughs> and the new ones will follow. Yeah. Boa tarde. É, meu nome é Orlando Zaconi, eu sou delegado de Polícia Civil no Rio de Janeiro e secretário-geral da LIP Brasil, da Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. E eu tenho acompanhado o seu trabalho de comunicar à sociedade a necessidade de mudanças na política de drogas. Inclusive no filme Cortina de Fumaça, é, tem uma cena em que você está fazendo uma exposição para jornalistas. A minha pergunta é exatamente essa. Se, a, a, se você coloca como importância para a mudança da política, a comunicação disso para o ambiente social, a mídia, a imprensa, né, ela tem um papel fundamental nisso, porque ela tem um poder de comunicação imenso. É, só que nós temos uma certa resistência na mídia, porque os jornalistas gostam de correr atrás da notícia, e nunca na frente da notícia. E nós, eu queria saber qual seria a melhor estratégia para que a gente convença jornalistas que mais importante do que correr atrás da notícia é correr na frente. Huh? No, that's a good question. I remember 20 years ago in my country, all the journalists just wanted to jump into the police car and ride around at night to the neighborhoods where the drugs and watch an arrest and all the TV programs, the same thing. At some point, they got tired of that. And at some point, it became more interesting for many to write about the new politics. Now, it's hard. I'll give you an example. In New York City, each year, the police arrest 50,000 people for a little bit of marijuana, mostly in their pocket. The police put the hand in the pocket of mostly young, black, and brown men, and they take it out, and then it's a crime because now it's out of the pocket. It was not a crime in the pocket. And the journalists did not pay any attention. But then we started to issue reports. We started to talk to the politicians on the city council and state government. 
we began to talk to leaders of the black community in New York. We began to talk to police officers who did not agree with the policy. Sometimes, like your question, the retired police officers were the ones who felt that they could talk, right? Um, so it was that sort of mobilization and change. The other thing is when you advocate, it's important to think about what the media will find easy to write about. So for example, we helped organize a demonstration outside the home of Mayor Bloomberg. But we also issued a report and identified a, spe a good reporter and said, you have an exclusive if you write about this. We, I'll give another example. Most organizations in New York City are not interested in marijuana. So you know what we did? We went to 50 other organizations in New York City working on issues of welfare, housing, safety, education. Most of them not interested in marijuana. And we said to them, we're putting out a report on how much New York City spends to arrest people for marijuana each year. We know you don't care about marijuana, but do you have a suggestion for how the city could better spend that money? Well, then we had a report, not just about marijuana, but 50 organizations saying, we think New York City could spend the money better in another way. So it was innovative advocacy. And that, that, that's the key thing, the key thing. Yeah. É, ótimo, ótima palestra, Nathan. Uh, eu sou um neurocientista que uh, gostaria de estudar a fisiologia celular do, dos endocannabinoides e das, das, das próprios princípios da planta e não a proibição que é o que eu acho que acontece agora uh, os resultados especialmente envolvendo os seres humanos a gente estuda a proibição e não a verdadeira ciência da planta o, o, mas ciência é um, não para então uh, ela não serve no meu entender para modificar não dá para eu controlar a proibição não dá para eu tirar a proibição então eu preciso de um mecanismo para tirar a proibição e eu acho que isso é chegar no legislativo da House, da Congress chegar no legislativo agora está acontecendo a marcha é uma ação uh, mas uh, 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 nos Estados Unidos existe muita uh, uh, advocacy, a ação política organizada é, você uh, consegue uh, Uh, como é que consegue essa lobby se, é, de um jeito que seja honesto e que funcione para uma boa política? Money helps. Um, so that's the first. And, you know, I was successful in raising money from very wealthy people who care about this issue for different reasons. And now we also have 30,000 people sending little bits of money. But the wealthy people, the wealthy businessmen who care about this issue for all different reasons, ideological, or maybe their son was a drug addict, or maybe they like to smoke marijuana, or maybe they don't like the racism of the drug war, Those finding just a few sometimes, and they can do it quietly, but that's the first. I think secondly, there's so much that one can do without money. You know, in many of our efforts with marijuana, people in a wheelchair and people who are older with a sign saying, don't take away my medicine, or don't treat me as a criminal because I use marijuana, that's very powerful. 
when we run the advertisements on TV, we don't use a young person. We use an older sick person, or we use a retired police officer, or we use a middle-class mother, right? We, we relate, use people that they can relate to. So, I mean, I, you know, sometimes people say, what's, what's the number one rule of successful advocacy? The number one ingredient, I should say, of successful advocacy? I'd say the answer is empathy. Empathy. E empathy. Empathy, the ability to put yourself in the shoes of the other and to think and imagine how they feel, how they listen, how they think. To put your shoes in the, yourself in the shoes of the police officer who has spent 20 years fighting the drug war and wants to go home and be able to feel good about his job in front of his children. To talk to the mother who has three teenagers and is really scared. To talk to the older person who doesn't know between marijuana and crack or whatever, or alcohol. That element of empathy, nothing is more powerful and important than that. Tell me how, I know you have the march, so I don't want to keep you, but somebody should stop me when it's time to stop, okay? Good afternoon, Professor Nadelman. It's a pleasure to listen to you. Um, I was wondering if you could share with us some updates about what's happening in Colorado and Washington, you know, uh, about the process of change and how, how good do you think the, the, the actual systems are going to be and more or less what's the time frame for change and also about the perspectives in other states uh, during the midterm elections. Is any more change coming? Uh, good question. So what's happening in the United States, when Colorado and Washington voted in November, in December, the laws became official. So in both states, it is now legal to possess up to one ounce, 28 grams, of marijuana in private. In Colorado, it is also legal to grow up to six plants in the privacy of your home, right? But both initiatives directed the state government to set up a regulatory system. The governors and other elected leaders are worried because it's all illegal under federal law. Now, the federal government and the DEA, they don't really care about small amounts of marijuana and they mostly don't care about people growing a few plants. But for the state government to set up a whole regulatory system and control it, license, tax, regulate, that is strictly in violation of federal law. And the President of the United States is not allowed to say to the federal prosecutors, don't enforce federal law. What he can say is, it's not a priority. So the governors of Colorado and Washington are devising plans that they hope will work for Colorado and Washington, but that the federal government will also allow them. Because remember, over in the United States, we do have legal regulation of medical marijuana. You go to Colorado or California now, there are now more legal dispensaries selling marijuana to people with a medical marijuana card than there are coffee shops in the Netherlands. And they're paying taxes and you can drive by them. And you know what? The sky did not fall. So, it's going to be a political process complicated by the conflict between federal and state law. I know Uruguay is trying to figure this out, and there's also the challenge 
of the International Anti-Drug Convention. But you know, I'll tell you, with the International Anti-Drug Convention, when Switzerland and Germany and the Netherlands and other countries decided to set up the uh, supervised injection sites, right, where drug injectors could use and not be arrested, the UN body said that violates international law. When those countries decided to allow heroin addicts to come to a clinic and get pharmaceutical heroin and medical services and welfare services in the clinic, the UN body said that violates international law. And you know what the governments in Europe said? You have your lawyers and we have ours. You know, I think Brazil has a lot of lawyers. And if you do something that's right for Brazil, you can say to the UN official people, you have your lawyers, we have ours. And if that doesn't work, take a lesson, believe it or not, from Evo Morales in Bolivia, who said, your convention does not work for us. Therefore, we're leaving it, and then we'll rejoin, but this time we make an exception for that clause that makes coca illegal. So I think that's really the answer. In terms of the next states, normally we would say wait till 2016. Wait till a, the year when the president is running because always in our country, young people are much more likely to vote when it's a presidential election and less likely in between. It makes a big difference. Uh, for us. But I'll tell you, I was in Oregon uh, last week, and maybe Oregon in 2014, maybe Alaska, California 2016, maybe Maine, maybe D.C., I don't know, maybe Massachusetts, maybe even a conservative state like Arizona or Missouri. Wherever we see a substan wherever we see that more than 50 and hopefully more than 55% of the public says they want to treat marijuana like alcohol, that's where we'll look and try to change the law there. É, meu nome é Rafael, eu estudo atualmente processos criminais sobre tráfico de drogas aqui em Brasília, e eu fiquei muito interessado em saber é, a respeito específico da, da atividade da Drug Policy Alliance é, Sobre quais seriam os atores chave Para serem atingidos nesse trabalho de advocacy é, E principalmente saberam a, a sua posição Sobre a, o fracasso da aprovação da legalização no estado da Califórnia Well, I think the most important people for us to reach, you know, well, I, I, I think about uh, the, the targets like a pyramid. So first we have at the top the people who are already committed. And for that group, the objective is to help educate and train and organize. Then the second group is for the group who agree with us, but they don't know that we exist, or it's not a priority. And so for that group, our objective is to let them know that there is an organization fighting for what they believe in, and actually successfully winning battles, and that there are good reasons for them to care more about something they already care about. And that means getting our organization's name in the media as often as possible in a good way. It means talking with influential people so that they will mention us in their speeches or on Twitter or Facebook or that sort of thing. The third group is the group that doesn't know so much, that does not feel strongly one way or the other. 
right? That's the group, when we have 50% of the public on our side, that's the group we talk to. Because we need them to vote. That, that 10, 15, 20% in the middle. And that's where, as I said before, it's doing some research to find out which messages mean the most to them. And although I wish they cared more about the issue of freedom, which is what I care about most, I know it's not what they care about. So I try to present my argument in ways they understand. And for our opposition, the ones who are opposed, well, I spend a little bit of time to try to persuade them to change their minds. But don't waste too much time. I also spend time trying to undermine their legitimacy in the eyes of the media and the politicians. And that means getting as many of the scientists and the academics on my side so that whenever our opposition says something that is false, it's not just me responding, it's the independent experts. Boa tarde, meu nome é Tadeu. É, eu fiquei, é, gostei muito da apresentação e principalmente o que me mobilizou foi é, esse mapa atualizado que você está do Brasil. Isso para mim foi tocou em pontos muito sensíveis da nossa história, né? A tortura e associando isso com a internação compulsória, a Copa, a Olimpíada. E eu queria um pouco adensar esse mapa te trazer um pouco mais ainda para esse campo, para ver como é que que diálogos surgem daí, o que, que você pode também ajudar a refletir. né? E eu acho que a gente vive na sociedade brasileira um momento extremamente delicado. Nos últimos anos, a gente tem investido em dois blocos, tem sido muito mobilizados na sociedade. Um é o bloco econômico, que nos últimos anos a gente tem é, mudado o padrão de diferença entre os mais ricos e os mais pobres Uma política desenvolvimentista Com aumento de renda, emprego, enfim E um outro bloco que tem sido o bloco dos valores Onde a sociedade tem se posicionado mais claramente Em relação a algumas questões que eram tabus para a nossa sociedade Que é o casamento gay, o direito ao uso de drogas O direito ao aborto, o direito ao parto domiciliar, questões que mexem com as nossas instituições autoritárias, né, com, com o poder autoritário que ainda existe na sociedade. E para sustentar esse projeto econômico, o governo ele tem tido necessidade de aumentar a sua base aliada no governo, sobretudo com a bancada religiosa, que é justamente a bancada que tem feito uma forte oposição aos movimentos de vanguarda e esses movimentos pela busca de novos direitos, que, que entra aí também o tema das drogas. Então é um cenário extremamente delicado, onde para você sustentar um projeto econômico, a gente tem visto retrocessos em relação à busca de direitos e mudanças do padrão de sociabilidade e mudanças de valores muito caros a grupos minoritários do Brasil. Então eu acho que aí se coloca uma situação difícil mas que se a gente não conseguir conciliar esses dois movimentos, né, de fazer um crescimento econômico com o um movimento da, de mudança de valores, a gente em breve vai ter um país de classe média extremamente fascista e que vai querer a todo custo se livrar da ameaça da miséria, que é uma ameaça a essa propriedade privada recém conquistada, desculpa, e que de fato tem sido o tema do crack das drogas, que tem sido um principal tema de mobilização, de pavor, dessa base de voto e que a bancada religiosa que tem comido é, esse, esse campo e crescido assustadoramente. Enfim, trazer um pouco esse cenário para você e ver como é que a gente consegue avançar nesses dois sentidos. Obrigado. Thank you, thank you for your comment um, and also for your passion. I just, at one point, it was hard to hear the translation. Um, if I understand your question, uh, here is my answer. Um, 
you know, there's always a tension between trying to pursue the objective of ending the drug war in a way that pulls from across the political spectrum, which is what Drug Policy Alliance does and others. And another approach, which is about embedding this issue in a more progressive movement for broader reform around issues of inequality and justice. And the approach that I have typically tried to do is to see our mission as focusing on ending the drug war. Yes, the issues of poverty and inequality are fundamental in this area. But I know that for me to win, for us to win, I need to bring people from the right wing and the church and others with us as well. And so I avoid using the language of the left or of the right. I'm always looking for the language which can appeal to the values of both. Finding those words, right, that work both for left, right, and center, and those ideas. Because I think that's ultimately how we prevail. Um, I, I also think that in dealing with the church, You know, some of, in dealing with the church, and I spend more time now with this. You know, I was uh, last month, two months ago, speaking in front of 500 African American ministers. And then I was in, where was I? I was in Asuncion, Paraguay, yesterday. And one of my meetings was with a senior person in the Catholic Church, right? And with their, it's about, for them, oftentimes, it's about, their obligation oftentimes is about helping the poor, at least in theory. But that's what the church believes, right? I mean, with all their, the Catholic Church, with all their intense moralism around issues of sexuality and reproduction, and, but there's still the commitment to the poor, and other, not just Catholic, but others. And interestingly, in the Bible, there is not really a drug prohibition, right? I mean, there are prohibition on homosexuality, prohibition on this, prohibition on that, you know, go be fruitful and multiply, so no birth can, I mean, but about drugs, not really. Where does it say, thou shalt not consume marijuana? It doesn't. I mean, alcohol is all over the Bible. Drunkenness, being drunk, you know, the son of Noah is punished because he sees his father in his drunken nakedness. Uh, there's the story of the priest Eli and Hannah asking God for uh, help to have a child, and the priest Eli thinks she's drunk. So they make the distinction in the Bible between the responsible use of a drug like alcohol and the irresponsible. And I find that with it, talking with people in the church, they don't, the punitive approach to drugs is not grounded in theology. And it can be antithetical to helping the poor. So it's really making, I mean, so much of this is about conversation. When I meet with politicians or ministers or other people who disagree with me, I just want to plant some seeds, give them some seeds of doubt about what they are saying and doing so that they can begin to think another way, you know? I mean, it's always the, the bigger question, 
How does one persuade conservative, wealthy people to support policies that help the poor? Ultimately, one way is the party that represents the poor takes power. Another way is one persuades them that helping the poor serves their interest as well. So it's an approach, you know, the other thing I know is that for our movement, which is still relatively weak, even in the United States, we, don't, we cannot succeed by force or by threat or by anger. We have no choice but to work through persuasion and convincing and logic and our passion. So I don't know if that answered your question really, but it's as much as I could, as I understood. Okay. É, boa tarde. Meu nome é Diogo e eu tenho uma pergunta sobre o Colorado e o Washington, já que é um, uma situação muito nova e que ainda não tem conclusão nenhuma sobre o que realmente vai acontecer. Quais são os cuidados que devem ser tomados nesses estados para que o que está sendo feito seja bem sucedido ao longo dos anos e se os dois argumentos que você citou que foram os que fizeram a diferença podem ser usados e terão a mesma força em estados mais conservadores como o sul dos Estados Unidos, Texas e em outras sociedades não tão abertas e não tão liberais quanto os Estados Unidos que é o que eu acredito que seja o Brasil sociedade mais fechada e mais conservadora Obrigado uh -huh. yeah, por perguntar essa pergunta Sometimes I look, what happened in the United States in the 1970s? The, the society became very liberal. Marijuana was in the open. 11 states changed their law to decriminalize marijuana possession. President Carter introduced a bill in Congress to decriminalize marijuana. And then, boom, Ronald Reagan, change, young people became more conservative. What I said before, from 1979 to 89. So I want to, when I study that period, I say, what were some of the lessons? The first one is, don't think you've won until you've won. Back then, my predecessors, they thought victory, they could smell it, but it was an illusion. Only 30% of the public was in favor. They were, too, they were close, but they were not that close. And they needed to make their strategies for the long term, not the short term. Second, in the surveys of drug use, in 1978, 79, according to the surveys, 10% of all high school, like 17-year-olds, said they were smoking marijuana almost every day. Not good. Because when 10% of 17-year-olds are smoking marijuana every day, That means tens of millions of parents are flipping out. That was not good. And my predecessors, who were so successful and deserve tremendous credit for changing those laws, they did not have an answer. So what do I do? When people say, well, marijuana, that's not addictive, I say, Wait a second. Some people become addicted to marijuana. You can become addicted to anything. And becoming addicted to marijuana can be a problem. I say, nobody wants their children smoking marijuana. And you don't want your teenage... You have the expression in Portuguese, wake and bake. Wake and bake to get up in the morning and smoke marijuana. Not a good thing. So we produced a document and a program, and we call it Safety First. And it's directed at middle-class parents concerned about their young people and drugs. 
So that was the second lesson. The third lesson is, I listened carefully. A few weeks ago, the Attorney General Holder was asked on con by Congress, so how are you going to decide what to do with Colorado and Washington? And he said, I'm going to focus on protecting children, reducing violence, and reducing organized crime. That was good from my perspective. He could have said, it's all illegal under federal law, and I'm going to enforce federal law. He did not say that. He said, I want to protect the kids, reduce violence, and reduce organized crime. Why do I like that? Because that's our objectives as well. He said his objectives were the same as our objectives. Therefore, I want to frame the policy. The other thing we have to watch out for, you know, always in activism, there's always the challenge, like with the 420 march, right, of celebrating the marijuana and people who are, who you want, who are in the middle become, they don't like it. But there's a bigger challenge we have now, which is now people can make money in the marijuana business semi-legally. And so we have people pushing to make as much money as possible, as fast as possible. That is not good for us. You know, I am not fighting for the Marlboroization or Budweiserization. Do you know what I mean? The, the mass cigarettes or mass beer of marijuana. I am reaching out to the doctors and the public health people and saying to them, don't fight against legalizing marijuana, accept that it will happen, and join the debate about how we make marijuana legal. I want, to have, I want there to be a debate between the people trying to make as much money as possible and the people who are, care about public health. I want the debate on marijuana to be like the debate on tobacco. That fight, that debate. Especially because marijuana is much less dangerous than tobacco, right? So it's thinking in that tactical way. I also hope that when we do the next ballot initiatives, we should try to do them in where we're going to win. You know, there are some activists who say, let's just do it. Win or lose, let's do it. But let's look, where do we have the best chance? Where do we have the best chance? In Washington, the campaign was very successful at getting some of the most influential people in law enforcement, top police, top prosecutors, to endorse, to support the campaign. Big difference. So it's that step by step that I think will be key. Olá, Ethan. Sou Lucas, sou psicofarmacologista, pesquisador do CEBRID, o Centro Brasileiro de Informações sobre Drogas Psicotrópicas, um, uma instituição da Universidade Federal de São Paulo que há muitos anos, na figura do professor Carline, diretor do CEBRID, é, faz esforços tanto com pesquisa quanto com divulgação de informações sobre drogas e também com esforço para mudar um pouco a política de drogas, especialmente voltado... É, para o caso da, da cannabis. Mas a, a minha pergunta seria, é, quando você falou sobre, após essas mudanças nas políticas dos estados do Colorado e Washington, é, algum, algumas semanas depois da oficialização, houve um comunicado emitido pelo INCB, é, falando, é, não condenando, mas dizendo que eles poderiam estar infringindo alguns a, a, o tratado de, da, da ONU de 61, enfim. É, então, eu queria que você falasse um pouco mais sobre esse papel do INCB é, para lidar com essas políticas novas que estão sendo colocadas em outros países, até que ponto eles influenciam, pode influenciar isso, se eles têm algum poder de veto, como é que a gente lida com isso? Ok, thank you. I think I answered some of that question before when I said, 
you have your, your lawyers and they have theirs. The INCB, for those of you who do not know, is the official watchdog of the UN Anti-Drug Convention. But they have no real powers or police. You have the expression, a paper tiger, in Portuguese. Do you have that expression, a paper tiger? It means something that looks scary or powerful, but it's not. And so I think the answer really is, is when INCB says no, you say you have your lawyers, we have ours. Or if the government cares, they get the letter from INCB, they drop it in the garbage. Or you begin to agitate to abolish the INCB. Because ever, if ever there were an agency that has no legitimacy, it is the INCB. Now, interestingly, in Europe, the European governments feel INCB, what they say, that's interesting, but we have our lawyers. Evo Morales says, INCB, you won't listen, we resign. And we rejoin on different terms. But many countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, they think the INCB is important. It's not. It's not. So I think what's most important is to change the laws in your country and worry about them later. Worry about them later. Okay, I think that's all for the questions. So thank you very, very, very much. Good luck for change in Brazil. Thank you.